We spend so much time as YouTubers talking about video games. Old ones, of course. Either the ones that should be praised on high, or those that are, in the immortal words of Steps, better best forgotten. We make videos, and you watch them. If folks who play games want to watch other folks who play games talk about playing games, they're more than catered for these days. Gaming is the most popular category of videos on YouTube. Tens of thousands of hours of gaming are uploaded to YouTube each day, from cod trick shots to finely cut reviews, faffing about in Minecraft, indie games, let's plays, men shouting in front of a stack of carefully organised Nintendo games, to that one video of someone being inappropriate with a mint condition copy of Last Battle. But ask yourself, what did we do before YouTube? Well, we didn't exist. Literally all of us burst into life around about 2007 or so. But what did gamers watch before then, when they weren't, you know, playing video games? How did they get their gaming fix on the TV? This is what this little video series is going to examine. Cause hell, who's looked at this? Who actually has any interest in looking at this, with the exception of me? Who loves covering old televisual artefacts of highly questionable quality, and who do you love? Yes! And so we're going wobbly, and going through the archive, of classic, if you can call it that, British Video Games Television. And of course there is only one place to start. If you're a certain age, you know exactly where I'm talking about. That helicopter flying into view, a journey straight down, tips and tricks delivered by an avuncular old conservative, and a Scottish man with a very heavy interest in pants and the contents thereof. The first show we cover is without a doubt the one people remember the most. There is only one, Games Master. A fixture on British screens for seven whole series lasting from 1992 to 1998, making it the longest lasting show that we're covering. In that time it proved to be a steady winner for Channel 4, holding court in the post T630 slot and earning a solid and sizeable cult audience. The name is still somewhat familiar today, with a magazine of the same name spinning off from the show. Said magazine became one of the UK's biggest selling monthly games mags and is still in print today, having long outlasted the show it spawned from. That's one part of the show's legacy, but in the main it's all about being the first proper gaming magazine show out there, at least in Britain. So how did it all begin? Now it's not like computers hadn't ever appeared on the telly before Games Master, it's just that it took a somewhat different, more sober tone. The 80s, what with its microcomputer boom and all that, was filled with programmes like Database and MicroLive. Dark sets, people huddled around computers showing off the latest code, and presented by a middle manager looking folk in awful suits. These programmes are famous for, in the words of Rab and Wine from Consolvania, describing every advancement in memory in terms of how many pages it could hold from a phone book. One day, we may be able to store enough information to fill 10,000 phone books. But these programmes firmly fell into the to educate part of the BBC remit. Games and like, as popular as they were back then, weren't often covered on these shows. And sometimes if they were, the coverage wouldn't necessarily be positive. If you go over the pond you can find an earlier show that was all about video games. Starcade! This is from the early 1980s and is all about arcade games. Ah, those glorious days when arcades were going to rule the world, just before the crash. However, this goes the other way. Starcade is, of course, a game show, based almost entirely around two gladiators huddled over their moon patrol cabinets, locked in brutal competition. They always seemed to be on the verge of bloodletting, but never quite passing the red line before the bell sounded and Jeff Edwards brought hostilities to an end. Ah, video games. Anywho, the original idea for Games Master didn't come from any kind of gamer. It came from a TV producer and creative bod by the name of Jane Hewland, founder of the imaginatively named Hewland International. She noticed how much her son was interested in video games, and how fixated he was to the TV when playing them. As you are. The light bulb goes off in her head, and she decides to construct a pitch for a show based around translating that excitement, that hook of playing games, into television. More than that, she notices other little details. The early 90s may have been a glorious golden age for games with Sega and Nintendo making money hand over fist, but it was also a recession, particularly in the UK. And yet still, all that money was being spent. Potential for advertising, you know? Jane Hewland went into pitch with all this and more, including a pilot that involved filming kids playing games, their reactions to the games and so on, all guns blazing. 
Even so, most fogged it off, thinking that games and TV, well, they just weren't compatible. Until eventually Channel 4 picked it up, back in the days when they'd pick up all sorts of things that were just new and original. Even so, the show was only given the pitiful budget of £10,000 per episode, and weirdly, thanks to the challenges and whatnot, fell under the purview of Channel 4's sports division. This might well explain why a whole load of sportsmen appeared on the show, more than anyone else to be honest. It also meant, in amongst the bevy of kids off the street that signed up to win a coveted Games Master Golden Joystick, you know, a Kempston painted with gold and ensconced in a cheap glass case, you also got the odd guy in who'd won gaming tournaments and stuff, like Danny Curley here. Or, of course, the unbeaten gaming animal, uh, but we'll get to him later. The history of Games Master reveals how inexperienced most of the people making it were. The director was literally fresh out of university, and no one had even heard of the host, a Scottish stand-up with floppy 90s hair and a red suit by the name of Dominic Diamond. The most famous name associated with the show was the Games Master himself, astrologer Patrick Moore. And considering that he'd spent over 50 years hosting the Sky at Night, this was not exactly his usual audience. But take all that, throw it into an old church in the middle of London town, base it all around a bunch of challengers with people playing games either on their own or against each other, including the odd minor celebrity, plus some reviews, hints and tips, and there you go, that was Games Master. And Jane Hewland's instincts were spot on. The show was a hit. The sort of thing that would only be expected to last for a single one, it would be a fixture for six whole years. But why exactly did it work? Looking at the show, there's a very definite formula right from the outset. A magazine formula that's always worked and still works these days. It's exactly the same formula that you would see on something like Top Gear. Everything comes from the big studio, you throw to outside features, you use the space you're in for banter and the challenges, and well, there you go. Current affairs and lifestyle programmes use that sort of thing all the time, but in these days it was slightly rarer to see the same thing for a programme aimed largely at the 10 to 15 bracket. But format isn't everything, of course. Shows live and die on the folks in front, and there was absolutely no better person to host Games Master than Dominic Diamond. If it wasn't for him, then perhaps the show wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. Of course, he's got the jokes and the double entendres, I mean, fucking hell, so many of them. This cheeky phallic references are plenty. This is a wide corner, oh, she's no, seen it very well. They've slipped inside her. A couple of men slipped inside Zoe there, and, uh, but she's managed to knock one of them off. She's going to have to get a grip of that throttle control and get a thighs wrapped around... Cocks upon cocks. Cocks out the arse. More cocks than an Audi owner's convention. It's all a bit near the knuckle, as they used to say in TV parlance. A bit of subversion at getting away with all this lewdness on a show basically aimed at kids. Juvenile, but funny. But Diamond's strength in the main is his enthusiasm, and the rapport he has with just about everyone on the show. Despite the jokes, he's not here to take the piss. How do you think Kendall will rate against an opponent somewhat smaller than he's used to? Um, I think you'll beat him quite easy. If you can beat people like Giant Haystacks and Pat Roach, I think this little fella here is going to be quite a walk over. Well, I wonder what our audience has to say about that. He genuinely enjoyed games, which isn't something we'll get from all the presenters we'll be seeing. And even though he'll usually defer any game in details to his co-commentators in the challenges, he's adding the excitement to it. He's just very likeable, really, particularly in the first two series. He's in sync on the tail of Rex. on Rex. I think he's going to give Rex a hefty smack in the face here. Of course, if you want to see what Games Master is like without Dominic Diamond, you could always go to Series 3. Dominic quit for a series, apparently due to the big sponsorship deal that the show landed with McDonald's, and was replaced by Dexter Fletcher. And who, boy, is he awful. Welcome to Games Master, the show that never lets you down. Tonight, we'll be racing through Gotham City, getting trapped in the dark and lighthouse, and watching the famous struggle for glory in the challenge hot seat. A very aggressive, very loud and in-your-face cockanay. His style was completely unsuited to the show, coming off like a demented presenter of Funhouse or something. Pat Sharp, but without the mullet and any of the charm. More than that, beyond all the histrionics, it's kind of clear that he didn't give a flying shit, had bugger all knowledge and didn't care to have any. Now the red dots are the energy bar of the enemy, aren't they? Yeah, that's right, that's not really re relevant right now. Okay, he's also had his energy topped up, so he's doing okay. He's motoring now. Go on, no put your foot down. It's the end of level Guardian he's reached. The end of level Guardian he's reached. More energy than the end of level Guardian yeah, has. I hate these fucking southern fairies.
It just wasn't any good really. The guy was an actor after all, not a presenter, and he would go on to better things. Oi! Keep your fingers out of my soup. If you're going to watch classic Games Master, then needless to say, the third series should be avoided. Anyway, he quit after one series, got his fingers firmly out of the Games Master soup, and Dominic got the reins back for the fourth series. Of course, there was more to it all than just hosts and challengers. There were also reviews to boot. Now, these parts of the show are, well, intriguing in a way, just to see the old games on display. The reviews, while very short, usually featured gaming journalists of the time, including, for example, old Julian Rignall here. Now, seriously, Jez, what in the fuck could you possibly be thinking? I know gamers generally aren't fashionable, but seriously, this is just not with the times. Do you realise how stupid you are going to look in retrospect? I mean, for fuck's sake, a 36% score for River City Ransom? That just will not stand. Slightly better are the features that you'd get. These are mostly of the time, of course, with things like bots from Sega talking up the way they constructed their ad campaign to be different from Nintendo, or a preview for a new game or system or what have you. Jimmy is a hero. He always gets the women who's brilliant at playing Sega games. If he played pool in the pub, he'd win. Um, he's probably got a Harley Davidson bike, and he's probably a brilliant surfer in California. You also got some really quite odd shit. Here, have Dave Perry talking about a mystical future where you can go from playing one game straight into another completely different game. Well, one minute you could be wandering through the castle of Thodar or something with your dragon slaying sword, and you could go through the door and find yourself in Nigel Mansell's Grand Prix car or something, shooting around a circuit, crash into the barrier, and all of a sudden you're in a MiG-29 over Iran or somewhere. I mean, a couple of hours. Yeah. This kind of sounds like a page from the Peter Molyneux playbook, I reckon. Oh, and how about this? Mario and Sonic against each other? <laughs> if only you knew, Dave. If only you knew. One of the other constant features was the almighty Consultation Zone, where struggling gamers donned the old Virtuality Helmet, basically a very, very early prototype of the Oculus Rift, and asked the Games Master himself for help with their game of choice, at which point old Sir Pat would usually pour scorn on the kids' inferior gameplay abilities, but provide the info that they needed. Now this was the most important part of the show. Many a time was I on the edge of my seat, hoping to get a tip for the game that I was struggling with. And if you didn't get a tip, then well, hey ho, fuck you, that's life in the big city. Tune in next week. These extra bits padded out the show well enough, but they were kind of ropey. I mean, let's face it, most folks in the gaming world aren't the most dynamic personalities on screen, certainly not then. The reviewers in particular always came across like assholes who didn't really enjoy anything. Nice to have, but the show was all about those challenges. Ah, the infant days of esports. Who could have predicted that back in 92? Over the course of seven series, Games Master had a whole load of moments, and a whole load of changes, particularly as the budget got bigger. Why, it went from a church, to an oil rig, to a prison, to hell, heaven, Atlantis, and ultimately to a desert island. Bloody hell, no wonder Channel 4 always seemed to be short of cash these days. But the challenges made for some damn fine television, and over the course of re-watching various episodes, I've come across more than a few highlights. Here's a cool clip from the first series, with the crafty cop himself, Eric Bristow, just missing out on the joystick whilst trying to cut off all the girls' ponytails in Heimdall. Notable because every time you miss, you end up inserting an axe into the poor lady's head. It was said that while Games Master did get complaints often, it was always for things like this, the violent content of the games themselves, something which was naturally always a concern at the time, what with Mortal Kombat and the like. As it goes, there were never any complaints about all those cock jokes. Speaking of violent content, here's the special gore episode, only broadcast at half twelve in the morning and packed full of all the bloody fighting games and lurid FMB games they couldn't show before the watershed. Oh, and Robocop. For some reason. As far as features go, well, how about this one I found? A look behind the scenes of, of all games, Craptacular Digital Pictures beat em up Supreme Warrior. They're in Hong Kong and everything. And there was the odd supreme feat of gameplay, such as this guy, a Virtua Fighter Tetsujin, coming all the way over from Japan and beating 100 out of 100 plucky British opponents in Virtua Fighter 3. Sure, I'm quite convinced that a bunch of them had never even played the game before, but still, no mean feat. But of all the incidents in the show's history, none quite stick out like this. 
Series 6, the end of year Christmas special. A challenge involving none other than the games animal himself. Almost as big a feature on the program as Dominic and the Games Master, the bandana wearing Dave Perry was an expert. He'd never been beaten on Games Master, no matter what the game. He adopted the classic cocky heels persona as a result, causing much wailing and gnashing of teeth, gamers grabbing their joysticks in frustration and training hard so that they could beat him, but none succeeded. In this instance though, he would go up against another frequent guest and decent games player, the long-haired Kirk Ewing. The game? Super Mario 64, a ride down the cool cool mountain. A game that apparently the animal had never played before. It wasn't even out in this country. Dave had publicly said that he wasn't going to be getting an N64 until it had come out in this country. So as Dominic and his co-host, Dominic, laid out the ground rules, Kirk stepped up first, getting halfway down in a brave attempt before falling off. Dave then went up and, well, he struggled. According to him, he'd never even played a game on an N64 before. He has all the pace of a tortoise traipsing slowly round the planet mud before, shockingly, falling off just after the first turn. The game's animal had been put down for the first time ever! Hold the front page! But who boy was it controversial. In a frosty post-match interview, there were immediate claims from Dave that the whole thing was a setup. On the show, you are the greatest games player in Britain. What happened? What went wrong? Well, I think I've been set up fairly badly here today. Right. And in particular, what reason? I think having a final game where one player owns the game and the machine and one player doesn't isn't in the interests of fair play. Uh-huh. OK, then. So uh, what you're saying, Dave, is the biggest game of this year. You haven't played much. It's not released till next year. I'll play right. it next year when it's released in this okay, country. OK, you are a journalist. We can get it on import. Not a journalist. I'm a marketing manager. Right. OK, then. And you don't have a book coming out about, you know, games or anything like that? No? About, about beat em up. About beat-em-up games. So we're not seeing sour grapes at all here, Dave, is what you're trying to say. No, we're not. We're seeing somebody just saying he's been set up. OK, then. I know. And yes, the salt was very real. Dave Perry would never appear on the show again. Was he set up for a fool? Did Dominic set things up so that the animal would be at a disadvantage? Was he even possibly going for a shortcut? The camera was cutting away just before the crucial moment. And who can say, well, I mean, surely if he was, that would kneecap his claim that he'd never played the game before. There's actually been a lot of copy on this. Dave himself even had a whole blooming article on it on his old website, so I recall. It truly was the Gamergate of its time. Dave and Dom apparently didn't exactly get on behind the scenes. Perhaps that contributed. However, in any case, what's done is done. Perhaps I should leave it for you to decide. But nearly 20 years of passive aggro over the result of a challenge on Games Master? It's all a trifle silly, isn't it? Not too long after this, it would be time for Games Master to shut up shop. The show was still a consistent draw, but there were a few reasons for its demise. Some say that it was due to the fact that Jane Hewland and Channel 4's new head honcho, Michael Jackson, no, not that guy, this guy, didn't exactly get on, and old Wacko Jacko didn't really see it for Games Master no matter how well it was doing. Kinda like Greg Dyke and British Wrestling back in the 80s, I suppose. But in the main, there was a feeling from those behind the show that things were getting a touch stale and that the show had won its course. There weren't that many other places they could take it. Games Master's final episode is quite touching, with clips of all the best moments from the show, including the animal's fall, and heartfelt messages from those involved with the show, including, finally, a rather poignant send-off from Dominic himself. No, some people might have thought it's been flippant. To some people, it might seem as if it's been in bad taste, but... It was made with the total conviction that, to you, the viewers, it meant something. So I guess, really, now, with the last link of the last series, I should come up with the funniest gag in the history of Games Master, but uh, I can't. And finally, finally, a final shot of Sir Patrick Moore, finally free of his helmet, waving bye bye as he drove off in a cab. A tear in the eye of every Englishman. Games Master bit the dust, and with it went a sizeable chunk of British games television. For all that it was a somewhat ropey show held together by its presenter, however, it certainly had a tremendous legacy. A somewhat daring programme in its day that was even enjoyed somewhat by folks who were outside of the gaming world. It was proof that video games on television actually could work, in spite of some of the rather flawed examples we'll be seeing later on. And it is, of course, a massive full-blown dose of 90s nostalgia. 
Just everything about it makes it golden, if you ever want to hit. You can find every episode of Games Master on YouTube, and it's more than worth checking out from time to time. These days, most of the Games Master folk are living the quiet life. Dominic now resides in Canada, where he mostly DJs on rock stations. The animal Dave Perry now wants his own tattoo parlour, but he still gets calls to slip the old bandana on every now and again. And the Games Master himself is living the very quiet life. Sir Patrick Moore continued to take monthly residence on the sky at night before passing away in 2012, at the ripe old age of 89. Many tributes were paid to him by all the scientists and astrologists in the land, but there was another generation who paid tribute for a wholly different reason. He was the imposing old man in the helmet who finally helped them get past that fucking barrel in Sonic 3. And so, that's Games Master. A very worthy first episode, I'm sure you'll agree. Unquestionably the best remembered show that we'll be covering. But we're far from finished. Needless to say, Games Master's success spawned a couple of contemporaries. And next time, we'll look at two of them. Games World, which was basically Sky's answer to Games Master. And Bad Influence, a more northern production for ITV that wasn't quite an answer to Games Master, but certainly had its fans. That's all going to be in the next episode, though. In the meantime, my underlings have brewed me a lovely steaming cup of tea, and I'm off to pour it down my pants.